Hi class, this is the second lecture for uh, ECF 36B and we're going to continue to talk about um, object-oriented paradigm. Um, last time we mainly went over this two concept. There are two sides of object-oriented. One side is from the software development, the other side is from uh, the complexity of the problem itself. We're using OO as a tool to help us to do modeling. And for today, we're going to be pushing to the software development side. We want you to start to seeing some of the uh, um, um, C++ object-oriented language construct that you can start writing program in C++. Um, so particularly, we will be looking at this few principles that we mentioned very briefly, data abstraction, polymorphism, inheritance, encapsulation. And we are going to talk about how this four concept um, really showing up in program example. In particular, we're going to look at a particular class called Box. Uh, by the way, uh, this is important. I already announced yesterday uh, in the, on the Facebook as well as some of the um, uh, Canvas that we are uh, I, 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 we're using uh, this particular book, which is the beginning uh, C++ by uh, Horton, that this book is free. Uh, you can download online. And I already kept a copy uh, in the link uh, show on the screen that uh, I also showed the, the URL to access this link. In particularly today's lecture, we're going through chapter 11, which is the classes. Um, so I kind of jump because the first 10 chapter, they are mostly related to C and the basic programming. Because I assume you already know uh, the programming. For example, what is a loop? What is a if then else? And, and those kind of concept that I leave there if you feel you want to uh, get more information about all this concept, how they're doing in C++, then you can actually take a look at uh, those uh, um, uh, chapter, um, and then you can review it. If you have a question, you can feel free. By the way, if you have any question related to uh, ECF 36A, you can also ask in this class as well. Okay, but one of the important thing I cannot emphasize uh, enough is how important to do programming. So similarly, that every single program example in this lecture, as well as in the book of Horton, their source code is available. And I shared the link on GitHub that you can actually download every single program. And later I will actually have another video which is doing the demonstration for you to see how you can actually run those programs. And I believe running those programs and then listen to the lecture and then to read some of the material that from the book really help you a lot to, to grasp the, the solidly about the, the topic. Okay? Okay, so we're going to go over uh, this concept called class because class make difference between uh, the traditional procedural programming language, which we mostly focus on control flow and how data is integrated into the control flow. But in object oriented, we actually focus on modeling. We try to see what kind of class you like to define. In fact, all the object-oriented development, you have to start in thinking what are the classes that you need to have in this system. And from the classes, after you define, then you worry about how to coordinate, and then you worry about control flow, then you worry about how message are exchanged with each other. So we're gonna start it with, with a class. So in this slide, you will see that the class have two parts. If a, if a class, one part is what kind of data will be encapsulated, will be attribute in, the, in this class. 
so last time we say if it's a human, human has a uh, have a name, have an ID, have a, maybe a profile photo, have some kind of interest that they like to develop. That is a digital twin about each one of us that we can represent in a object-oriented fashion. Okay, so we have this uh, uh, data that we need to worry about. But the other thing is equally important I listed here is I use the word methods, but sometimes people call it interface. And for data abstraction, it's, it's, they use interface, abstract uh, data representation. It's, it's a way that how you're going to access the data within that abstraction. So MESA, you can think about it's a function, but that function has a particular purpose. So regular function is a standalone code. It can actually work with any kind of data. But this member function is a little bit different. Member function is particularly designed for working with this data that will be contained in the class, in the objects. So for example, flip to the next slide. So here is a picture that I actually use start to introduce C++ syntax. So in C++ that here we have, you have to define, uh, you have to use a keyword called class. And then you have to give the name of the class. And then you have two, between these two curly brackets, inside you actually separate your uh, content of that class into two different sections. One I call the private section, one I call public section. So private section is something which is within the class that you do not expose to that interface or member function. And, and therefore, for example, in this picture, I'm actually showing the class box. And inside the class box that you have three private variable or private attribute is called length, width, and height. All right, so those three things are, you, you cannot access from outside of the box that you have to access within the box or using those interface that to access those. So those interface are actually being listed under the public section. So, so we have essentially one, on one hand, we have a data attribute and the membership function or interface. On the other hand, this map to what we call the, uh, the private and the public section of this, all right? All right, so um, I'm going to show you this one. For example, now I'm going to show you the first example uh, about the class box. By the way, this program is, if you look at the first line, it says it, it is chapter 11, 01. That means it's under ex 11 underscore 01 folder if you go to the GitHub when you want to see this program. All right, so within this program, you can see that uh, there is a class called box, okay? Class box over there. And then you can see the separation. You see the green bracket. I kind of uh, listed all the private member. And then the blue is basically uh, the second part of the public. So you see that the private column and public uh, column, they separate your class definition into two sections. One section is for the private that you cannot access from anybody outside of this class, while public is really how you interface with the rest of the world. So let's first look at the private. So the private is has three variable, is length, width, and height. And this is uh, essentially being uh, initialized into 1.0, all right? So you have a three variable, each of them by default is 111, okay? They are, they are the, the, the data type of this three attribute is double, okay? All right, so now let's look at public. All right, so you understand what's a private, now look at how you can do that. So in the public, I only have two functions here. So the first function is called constructor. So constructor is a very special member function of every single class. Every single class must have at least one constructor. So what is a constructor? Constructor is the function that help you to do the initialization when you create this object. 
Okay, you, you can think about this as uh, if you still remember malloc and free. So malloc and free, usually when you do a C program, you allo dynamically allocate a piece of memory, and immediately after you allocate the memory, what you will do next is initialize. Make sure using some kind of routine, make sure the whole data is wiped out to be zero or, or set it to be certain kind of value. And this constructor is essentially trying to do that, it is trying to say after you allocate the memory, either dynamically or, or statically for this particular object, object instance of class box. So basically class box you can think about is a design, how you're gonna instantiate, then you from the class you get into the object from the class app box to the object box. When you got the object box in memory, and then what you will do, you will call this function called constructor, and then you can do some kind of initialization. All right, so that's the special uh, function in every single C++ class you create. You have to have at least one constructor. And by the way, when I say at least one, means that sometimes you can have multiple constructor because sometimes you want to create all different kind of box and you need different kind of constructor to fulfill that need for that flexibility, okay? But you must have at least one uh, constructor. All right, so you have a constructor and then the other function which is listed here is called volun. So, so volun is basically follow the the, uh, the formula. You can see that what it has is an object uh, and uh, it's a box. So you have a length, width, and height. So you tie those three things together and return the value. That's the volume you're going to get, okay? So that is the function. You can see that internally, I have three private variable which contain the property which other people cannot access directly. But then internally that you have that constructor help you to set the value initially. And then in the interface, people actually can get what's the volume of this, this um, uh, object, okay? So this is going to be your first uh, uh, experience. Look at this class definition about this, this object. Okay, and by the way, what we did in the previous slide is we mixing both the definition about the class and the implementation of the class together. Because class is a declaration about what is the structure, what is the interface looks like. But also once you define that interface, you have a implementation about really supporting from the interface to the private variable. And the previous slides I show you, uh, in fact, it makes this two together. So in a good design about, uh, from the software engineering perspective, we usually like to separate that. So on one hand, you have a definition about what that interface, what is private, what is public, what's available, and you don't worry about how you really connect that interface to the internal variable. So this picture I show you here is actually doing that separation. So this one is from, if you see the first line, it's called box.h. So in C++ convention, we usually split the definition part into the box.h, where the implementation part we call the box.cpp. So we kind of do that separation. So in other words, when I want to release the code to other people, I don't have to give them box.cpp, which is including all my needy detail, or maybe sometimes even my intellectual property about how I actually implement that class. But people want to interface with this class, this file, box.h, is sufficient. So it's important to do that separation. You see that this line, the code, I told you I have some private variable, I told you I have some public, but you cannot do anything to find out information about how I actually implement the constructor, how I actually implement the calculating those three things together. That's my secret 
That's my encapsulation. I don't want to reveal to you, but I just present this interface to you to allow you to develop a program you can compile and later it can link with the real implementation. Okay, so that is uh, the, the, the nice thing about data abstraction as well as encapsulation at the same time. Okay, so um, so far, let me show you what we have talked about. Uh, we talk about this 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 nice object which has uh, three variable length, width, and height, and then we have uh, um, um, a few interface that in this picture I actually have a uh, two constructor I put it here, and then I have some uh, another interface function called volun that you can actually call. So in the bottom of this slide, you can see that how. I use a simple program. This is what I call a driver or test program. So this is a main program that you will link with your uh, .cpp program together. And then you can actually, the first line basically say uh, first box and the box, whatever the, the bracket. And then it basically uh, compile, generate an object uh, called first box. And then basically you uh, also uh, use this first box to calculate the value of the first box volume, and, and then you basically print out. So there are three lines. One line is construct the object, the second one is call the function, and the third one just print out the result. That's a very simple program. You can see that now you have a program, you actually interface with the object. Okay? All right. So there is one thing you might or might not realize is the first line. The first line, it says box, bracket, and then has 80, 50, and 40. And, and depending on what is your, uh, your taste, I'm gonna show you a different version of the code. So here is, I'm rewriting this uh, two pieces. By the way, the button, uh, piece of code, those are the from the book, which is exactly the same in the previous slide. But the top is, is uh, sorry, I think I messed up. Oh, no, no, I didn't mess up. Okay. The top is actually another version of the code. I, I, I based on the Horton's version, I make some modification. And I want you to take a look at this very quickly to see what's the difference. All right, so the, the top one is, I will call it a traditional way about construct an object. So essentially I'm treating, I said box, first box. So the first box in the line number eight, the, that box is represent the type of the object. So it means it's a class name box. And the second one, of course, the variable name first box, that's okay. It's an equal sign. But the next one, the box that I have only in the top, not on the button, that that box represent is a constructor. So I make an explicit call to the constructor. I make this call to the constructor and then just like a function call. So I'm treating that box as a constructor. It's, please be careful. Sometimes you might confuse about the class name box and the constructor name box because they are both called box. And that constructor take three parameter and that will initialize. So when I call that first line, I not only create the object, but also I call the uh, box constructor. That's the, uh, um, the traditional way of C++ doing that. The bottom way of doing this is what we call the new way of doing this is called bracket initialization, which means that if you specify a class called box, which is the first word, which is a class called box, and first box, which is the variable name. So you have a class name, variable name. So the compiler or the programming language itself, they are smart enough, they know, okay, now you want to create a, uh, a object called box. And therefore, I don't need you to explicitly say you have to call this constructor. And therefore, I just use this bracket convention to represent the initialization variable. That's why it's called bracket initialization. And that basically is equivalent 
to the the traditional way the line line number is. So both line number A looks different, but they are exactly the same when when you get down to the execution. However, I just want to tell you that um, something uh, which is quite interesting in this slide. So the bracket initialization is not available until about 2011, which is because I don't know if you know that C++ compiler has so many different versions. I mean, from C++ 98 to 03 to 11 to 14 to 17, and the C++ compiler that I'm using today is called C++ 2A. All right, because it's after 2000, I guess, it's called uh, C... Wait a minute, no, it's after uh, 2020 or whatever, it's called uh, C++ 2A. Actually, that's an interesting question. I need to verify exactly 2A, the meaning of 2A. But essentially, if you just run G++, the command on some of the machine, you might not get the right compiler. In fact, in my machine, the it's, it's a MacBook, if I don't specify uh, minus std is equal to C++ 2A. If I don't specify that, then I'm actually uh, running with C++ 03. And when I run compile Horton's example program, which is after C++ 11, it will give me um, syntax error. So I will encourage you to try the code to see the difference that bracket initialization is one of the new feature that's introduced after uh, C++ 11. All right. So the thing is that when you test the program, you always try to run uh, C++ 2A because then you, you kind of know that uh, this is this is something which can be accepted by the, uh, the current uh, popular version of the C++ uh, community. Okay, so so this line here is important. If you use uh, uh, um, just using a make file, you're using uh, your your um, um, Linux or or Mac or Window environment, make sure that you are using the right version of the compiler. And also, if you're using video. Um, sorry, Visual Code, uh, Visual Studio Code, and you also in the JSON, you need to modify uh, this to use the right version of the compiler, okay? So just let you know that. Okay, so what we actually learned then is that we learned about C++ class through this example. We learned about private and public variable, and we learned about member function as well as constructor. And also we learned about uh, bracket initialization. And there's one little thing which I didn't say in this slide that look at the third line inside the main function is std uh, column column count. So std colon colon count, if you see this notation, you know that, that before colon colon, that std represents something we call NAND space. So it means that this is actually from the standard library. Okay, if you, uh, some of you uh, using the older version of C, you might not never need to use this, but this is actually something which is mentioned in chapter one of the Horton that this is good for you to actually take a look. In fact, I recommend you to look at chapter one of Horton's book. It gives you an over, overall uh, picture about what's going on. All right. All right. Now let's, as I mentioned, now is the time for you to um, download some program and try to uh, watch the, the uh, my, my, coding demo demonstration, and then to run some program yourself. Okay, so um, let's look at the, um, the program. As I mentioned um, earlier, that all the program is being uh, uploaded from the source code. For example, in front of me is the, the simple code we went through in chapter 11. Uh, chapter 11, the first code is EX1101. Uh, and over here, you see that you have this uh, program nicely defined as the class box with the three private variable, uh, double uh, length, width, and height, and also with the uh, bracket initialization uh, for to 1.0. Okay, so of course you can 
just use your regular G++ compiler to do that. If you do G++ and minus O to EX11, if you do this, oh, you got a syntax error. Okay, this is this is basically say, as I mentioned, that uh, um, the bracket initialization was only available after uh, the G++ uh, version uh, 11. So if you compile the code with say 03 minus std is equal to 03, you're going to get, oh, sorry, not 03. It's, it's C++ 03. If you got C++ 03, you got this arrow. But if you do C++ 11, you're okay. If you do 14, you're okay. If you do 17, you're okay. And the, the version I have been using lately is 2A, which is the newest one, it's, it's good. So if you execute the program, uh, then you got your answer, which is you can check this is a correct answer. So this is a way, of course, you can use the uh, traditional command line terminal to build your program and to test your program. Okay, you can do this. And this is this is uh, really convenient for you to do that. Um, so I'm going to remove this. And I'm going to show you a different way of building it using something we call VSC, um, Visual Studio Code, which is a, a, a very simple scale down of IDE, which gives you a really nice uh, editing and then give you some capability for you to use this kind of JSON type of configuration to, to run your program or to compile your program. So I'm going to have this. I go back to the original state. So when you come here, if you have Visual Studio Code, uh, code install, you just click it. And this will bring you to the, the terminal. And the first thing you need to do, just step by step first, you have to click the Explorer. So now you have an Explorer, and then you just remember to click Open Folder. When you open the folder, yes, that's the folder because I want to develop in this folder, so I have that. Okay, once I develop this, I want to create a new terminal. Ah, so now you can see I have my terminal here. That's good, okay. And then what I can do is that I need to configure the, the build type. This is related to building a project or, or even like a make file, but we're doing it in, in, in the JSON format. So when I configure it, and uh, if I say create from the task JSON template, and there are multiple one, I will choose the others. Okay, when you see the others, this is a JSON. And if you look at this, this is very interesting. It, it really has uh, the tasks, which is, a sequence of JSON, so which means that you can have multiple tasks. And this is just have a one task. This task basically says, say the label is echo, and the type is shell, and the command is just echo hello. So one of the things I already can execute, this has nothing to do with the program we're developing, but this has to be the JSON about the runtime environment. So what I can do is that, I think I can just come over here, terminal, to so say, I want to run test. And then you see that it's already listed because you already defined there is a label called echo. So you will see a lab label echo here. So you just say echo. And I usually say just continue without scanning the input. So now, boom, you can see your terminal, which says that, hello, uh, that's, that's the that's the execution. Of course, this is not what we want to do. We really want to uh, compile this uh, um, um, the, the C program. So I'm going to... I'm going to cheat a little bit because I already built this somewhere else. I'm just going to copy and paste in. So I'm going to get rid of this, bring up my, this is what I what I have. I mean, I, you can type it in, it, it's, it's very nice. They can actually just help you to fill in all the difference. But here for the demo, I would just do this. Okay, so so let's see what what I have have here. This this same the same thing version two point zero is two dot zero dot zero, and we have a task. I own I have actually two tasks. One is to compile the code. One is to run the code. 
Okay, so the first task is called build, and you can see the shell is uh, this is a G++, it's a compiler, it's a command, but now I need to add some uh, arguments. That, that's important, just like any command, you, you have to do that. And the argument, basically the first one, remember I said I have to specify that uh, the version of the G++ is actually the right one. So this is the first argument is minus std is equal to C++ 2a. And then for this one, I can do this. I just include all the uh, CPP file in this, which is just one, one of them, so that's okay. And minus O, the output is going to be the workspace folder uh, base name, which is the name of the directory, which is exactly the, the things I want. And then I actually have the other uh, task, which is after we compile, which we want to have another one called run the program, and the command this time is just dot slash whatever the code we just generate from the from the build. And then I, because these two are depending on each other, so I basically have a uh, depend on, depends on, which says build, which means that this build will trigger this task to be run. So in this case, sorry, I have to get rid of this and I want to save it. Task JSON, I want to save it. Okay, now I'm going to ask you the new task. So when I run the task, it says there is a two, two tasks available now. One is build, one is run. I will just directly do the run. And now you can see a trigger. It will, it will do the uh, compiling first and it generate the executable and then in the SQ the code and then it produce uh, a nice uh, answer for us. Okay, so that's, that's a, a very uh, simple way of doing software development using a, a nice environment uh, such as uh, uh, Visual Studio Code, which will help you to um, to do a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm just showing you, show you the basic feature, but you can imagine that how you can just using this small JSON to be able to integrate a lot of things. Okay, all right. I think I will stop here and then we're going back to our lecture. Hi, welcome back. Um, so let's take a look at this slide. That uh, this is still uh, related to the box, but now I call it cube. By the way, this is an example uh, in chapter 11 of Horton's book. This is 11 11 underscore 06. Uh, 06, 02, sorry. This, is, this one is 02. Yeah, ex eleven zero two, so the top is a class definition or declaration for a class called cube. So the difference, by the way, the difference between cube and uh, box is that cube is length, width, and uh, height. They're identical. That's why I only have a one variable called site, which is a simplified uh, version of box. Okay, and I have a, uh, again, I have now the, the constructor, which is the cube on line number nine, and line number 10 is a function called uh, volume. Okay, but I have a new function on line 11, which is interesting, it's called compare volume. Means that I want to compare the volume of this particular cube against the other cube. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the top uh, uh, figure. So you can see the parameter of that particular uh, function called compare volume, which is a public function. The parameter of that function is an object itself. Is a, you can see that it's called cube uh, space a cube. Okay, so the thing that's interesting is on particular cube, and the parameter, there's another cube, another object as a, as a uh, parameter that go into me and I'm actually trying to compare whether my own volume is greater than or smaller than or equal than the other object which just being input as a parameter. Okay, so that's the new function called compare uh, volume. Okay, so now we look at the button part which is the main function, it's a driver um, to 
stitches all the object together. So you can see that the main function, they have a two box, box one and box two. And they use bracket initialization. So box one is a 7.0 as the side, and box two is 3.0 as the side. So the first function, uh, the first line of the if then else statement is that if box one dot compare volume and use box two as a parameter. So essentially we're pushing box two into box one and say, hey, box one, are you bigger or smaller than, than uh, box two? So this is very well written and we understand the semantics after you look at the interface, by the way, you don't even need to look at the implementation of a volume, but just look at the interface and the driver. Now you actually see that how this two should work together. Okay, that's fine. Okay, what's interesting is the second call, which is a, uh, on my screen is a line 15, which is between line 14 and line 16. Is that it, it says if box stop compare volume and it says 50.0. It says 50. What do you what do you think about what this is happening? Okay, so by the way, we're assuming the interface of the cube dot h, the, the class cube, is on the top. Therefore, uh, we're expecting the function compare volum is taking the parameter which is a object cube. But here, what you saw is a double or it's a floating point number, which now you have a, um, uh, a type mismatching, right? One is object, one is a, a double or floating point. Okay, so now the first question I want to ask you, uh, what this is? Do you think if you run compile this piece of code, will you get a compiler error? or will you get a runtime error? Because at runtime, you are actually treating that number 50.0 as a maybe a reference to an object cube. Or there's other things you need to worry about. Okay, so this is why sometimes I ask the student or whoever wants to learn programming, at this time, how do I know? Run the program. Write the program just like this and run and see if you stuck at compiler time or you actually uh, get stuck or get, get a crash at the time when you try to execute this program or you actually get some result which you try to interpret what the meaning of the result. Well, in this case, it's very interesting. In this case, that you actually won't get a compiler error. I mean, if you're using uh, C++ 11 and later, you won't get a compiler error. And if you, you won't even get a runtime error because this program will just continue run and give you some result. And in fact, it's interesting that this is related to earlier I present you a concept called bracket initialization. So let me actually tell you what the compiler is reading this, this statement. So this is the interesting part. You think about how a programming object-oriented programming language is trying to help or is trying to curse the software development. That's, that's the strong word I'm using because sometimes I feel you have a nice feature, but this feature might not help you. It, it create confusion because the other programmer doesn't know what you're doing here. So here is a, the, the, the how compiler saw the statement 15. This is very important. So when they saw box one dot compare volume, and then they saw inside this parenthesis, there was a 50.0. So the compiler is very smart. Compiler is actually saying that, wait a minute, I know that the function compare volume has only one function. It's not being overloaded. I mean, by the way, we'll talk about function overloading uh, later but not, not right now. So you look at the definition, there's only one compare volume being defined in the interface, number one. And that particular interface has taken only one argument. And that argument is an object to this class called cube. So therefore, how do I best interpret that 50.0? And the compiler happened to know that the constructor of that class called uh, uh, cube 
also take a one parameter, one argument, and that argument match this type of this argument, which is a double. So therefore, the way compiler do is I'm going to show you on this slide is equivalent of doing this. So for me to say box one compare volume 50 is equivalent for me to say box one compare volume cube bracket 50 because it's an implicit compiler, sorry, implicit constructor call using this um, what we call bracket initialization formalism. Okay, so I mean, in other words, this is a surprise to me for those people who doesn't, maybe some of this is some of the programmer, they made a mistake. They they misunderstood the, the class cube. They, they thought they can just put in uh, a 50 uh, as the volume they want to compare, not as a constructing object with a psi 50 because the psi 50 and the volume 50, they are totally different concepts. And therefore, if you put this compiler play smart, and the compiler say, hey, this is great. So you have uh, uh, one line of such code within the project of 10 million lines of code, and good luck. You can, you say, why my final answer is always wrong? And now eventually you realize that, okay, here is compiler is doing something smart. Okay, so, so this is some very bad problem. If you have this, especially you have a teamwork and you have multiple people involved in programming and this sometimes creates problem. And therefore to take care of this problem, if you see this is what the, the textbook is, is telling you is that they actually can uh, get away with this problem by require when you define every single class in the constructor, you actually add a, another keyword called explicit. So not implicit, you have to say explicit. When you say explicit, like I show in the slides, say explicit cube double side, then when you run compile the same program, I show you the, the compiler result in the bottom of the slide, you see I'm getting compiler error because the compiler know, oh, I cannot be playing smart. I have to respect that keyword called ex explicit, and then it will throw you out. Okay, so in some sense, I feel that, okay, bracket initialization is really convenient, but you have to be careful about this implicit, explicit constructor thing. And if you want to use this type of uh, construct, I will highly recommend every constructor need to be explicit. So that's the program, that's what we call coding convention, whether you're doing the right thing to help other people to understand your code or help others not misunderstanding your code, okay? All right, so I'm going to cover one more topic in uh, chapter 11 uh, related to the class, which is uh, what we call the um, uh, static variable. So I'm actually show you an example that we have now introduced the concept of a class, which is a class called box, it has a length, width, and height. And then based on this class, this is our master plan that we create a bunch of objects over here, right? Every time you call the constructor, you create an object. So now my question for you is that, well, um, how will you easily uh, keep tracking or counting how many objects that you have created based on this class definition. Okay, to, to do this, you can think about how you're going to do this. I mean, we hope to do that without having an external variable. We hope to do that within the, the variable itself, that we can keep tracking that how many objects that has been, has been uh, created under this class. And the idea of this is, is we're actually introduce a variable called static variable. So static variable is something which is associated with the class as a member, not associated as a member as each individual object. So which means that no matter how many objects that you create instantiated from this class, that variable is only one associated with the class. That's why uh, there's other terms. Sometimes we call this class object or class or meta object, but I won't tell you because different objects are in the system, they use different names. But essentially this is a static variable 
and it's only one copy and it's associated with the whole class, not associated with any object. So in this figure, I'm, I'm showing you that the red represents those three red uh, uh, private uh, variable. When you create uh, a new object, you actually duplicate. You have uh, lots of copy of the three variable for every single object that you created. However, no matter how many objects you created, that blue star represents the count of the object will stay there. It's only one copy that associate with the class. Okay, so I'm going to show you a example that this is an example of a box. It is also uh, uh, in the chapter 11 of the textbook, uh, Horton. Um, it, it defined class, but now instead of having three variable, length, breadth, and the height, I'm actually going to introduce another uh, variable called object count. And that object count now has a attribute called static. All right, so now you see that there is a red, there is a blue. Okay, then you actually see the code it looks like this. And you have this object count. And then now what you have is every time you have a constructor, every time constructor is called, you actually increase, increase the object count by one. So now you can actually keep tracking. Okay, this is actually very useful. And the other thing, which is that it's interesting, just show you very quickly, that you can actually access to those static variable even before any object is created. For example, over here, that I can actually use a function called box colon colon set object count 20 before I even create the first object. Look at this. I can access that variable before I even anything get created. How do I accomplish that? It's like this. I actually define a function called static function. So I not only have a static variable, I have a static member function, which is also associated with a class and static voice set object count that inside take one parameter called O count and I can actually set the value of that static variable. All right. All right. I'm going to stop here uh, for this lecture. But for chapter 11, I really want you to follow through, especially follow through the last example called truck load object, which is essentially a truck, including so many different objects. So it's actually fairly interesting to have a class that have other class that as its member. So it is a composite object, object including other object. And it makes things very interesting that you can represent a very complicated system if you can just extending the concept of object. Okay, so I want to always go back to my favorite slide almost every single lecture. Now we're seeing this two side. The modeling of the object, which now you have a few tools. You can start design, use your class or your constructor or using all the things you learned about the composite object in the truck load. And also you learn some of the uh, software development principles. Some of them might be good. Some of them might not be terribly good as I show you. Some of this is fancy, but it's not practical. It's confusing for large programming. Anyway, for you to experience, if you haven't written the program, you don't know what you're talking about. All right, I will see you tomorrow in class. Bye.